Well, good morning. Namaste. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for inviting me once again. Every time I get invited to speak here, I'm always kind of like surprised, like, when are they going to catch on? But apparently you haven't, and I'm going to exploit that as long as I possibly can. Before anything, I want to share my joy. I have a joy to share. There's nothing specifically to do with my message today. Um, so I belong to, I, it was mentioned in the introduction that Susan gave, I belong to an organization called the Hindu American Foundation. And I received a call from a colleague of mine, who is also a part of HAF, who lives in Texas. And he let me know that he and his family are taking a road trip, and they're going to be passing through Grand Rapids, and he'd love to connect. Now, before anything else, he mentioned when he said family, it's not just him, his wife, and his two kids. It's family. They're going to be 11 of them on this trip. And I said to my wife, think of the 10 people in this world you love the most. Hopefully, I'm in that count. Now, think of those 10 people with you on a road trip. She said, no way. Same thing with me. I would have a hard time finding myself on the road with the 10 people in the world I love the most. There's just challenges that come up with, with a number like that when you're traveling. Two carloads of people. Um, but, you know, that is a wonderful element of Indian culture. They, they just do a lot of stuff together. Anyway, so he, he contacted me on uh, Friday morning. We agreed that he would come to my house. That he was, at, at that point, they were staying at a Holiday Inn in Cedar Springs, and they were going to come down to Grand Rapids, spend a little bit of time with me, and then head towards Chicago. Okay, so I texted him my address, and then I texted him some other information. I said, when you come to the property, the code at the gate is, and I gave him a number, I said, then you're going to take the road about a quarter of a mile, and the first place you're going to come to is the carriage house. Not, so you have to go past the carriage house about another hundred yards, turn to the right, and there's the house. Okay. So, a few minutes later, I'm standing close to the door, and I'm getting a phone. I see my phone is lighting up, and it's my friend Rajiv. And I also see a car parked in front of my house, and I know why he's calling. Because there's no gate. There's no quarter-mile road from, from the main road to my house. There's n it's all made up. There's no carriage house. There's nothing. I live on a in a house just like the houses around here. But he didn't know that. So he, he's in his car in front of my house wondering, uh, this seems to be the right address, but... And, and he... he he's calling me, and I just run out to the porch, and I yell, Rajiv, and he rolls down his window and says, where's the gate? <laughs> Go, Rajiv, you know me, I would have a gate? And the family just loved that that happened. That was my joy. I'm, I'm easily joyful. Um, so I want to start my message officially by talking about an incident that my wife had several years ago. She was standing outside a church downtown, and she was about to go in. Um, she was with a group of people, and they were going to go to a funeral service of a gentleman who unfortunately had committed suicide. And uh, Needless to say, the, the mood was rather somber. And he suffered depression. In this little group of people, there was a gentleman who said, 
uh, very odd. It just dropped out of the sky. They were talking about depression, a couple of people. And the man said, oh boy, oh boy, they, they must be depressed in India a lot. Teresa goes, why would you say that? He goes, well, you know, because of their religion. Well, he didn't know that the religion of India was the religion of my wife. And she didn't know what to say. And at that time, she was the executive director of our children's museum here in Grand Rapids. And he was somehow, I forget, he was a part of that fellowship, if you will, that, that organization. He wasn't an employee. He, I don't know if he was a member of the board of directors or what, but somehow he was connected to the museum. Teresa was astonished that he would say something like that. She knew he didn't know that she would take personal offense at this. So she really wanted to talk to him. She really wanted to just sit down with him and say, you said this at the church, you probably don't know my spiritual background, but I took offense at this, and, and I, I want to help you understand that, that that statement of yours is untrue. Well, certainly they have depression in India. They have depression all over the world. But it isn't the religion itself, per se, that is causing the, the, uh, the depression, at least in, in most cases. So she approached a colleague of hers at the museum and, and was looking for advice. It's like, should I approach this person? And I realize I'm taking a risk because now that I think of it, he probably was a donor. And the advice given to her was, do you think it would change his mind? And she thought on that for a long time. And she said, no, I don't think it would. He was coming from a very, very conservative Christian background. And there's a mindset there that isn't easily going to be changed. And I would suspect he's seen all of these videos made by missionaries that uh, try to paint India in a particular way. So she decided, she decided to withdraw from that, not, not to take that step. And that's fine. That would, so I'm going to share another story with you. Uh, and it also has to do with spiritual prejudice. Uh, I was staying with a cousin of mine in the Detroit area, which is where I'm from, uh, 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 over the weekend. I actually had a yoga and meditation uh, program that was happening at a hotel all weekend, but the hotel was fairly close to my cousin's. He's always been asking me to, to stay when I can, so I said, why not take advantage? So I'm staying with him and his wife, and I had recently returned from India where I was on a lecture tour. And one night, uh, we were together. I'd finished all of my business at the hotel for the day, and I showed him some pictures from my trip to India, including one at a temple. And the, the, the reaction I received from them was absolutely stunning to me. I've often been asked, how did your family uh, react to your uh, adopting Hinduism as your, as your faith? And I said, you know, my family's been great, absolutely fantastic, just haven't had any issues. But here, things were different. They kind of freaked out at these pictures of me in a temple in India. And then my cousin said, are you still Catholic? And I said, no, not, no, I haven't been for a long time. And he proceeded to just lay into me about not being Catholic anymore. And I started to, to give him my reasons for moving away from that path, a path that I still respect very much. It nurtured me as a child, and for that I'm grateful, but, but I am in a different space right now. And all of a sudden, it, it occurred to me as I was trying to make some sense, you know, he's drunker than a skunk. He is three sheets to the wind. 
I'm not going to make any sense to him. And even if he was sober, what's the point? So after just a few minutes of trying to defend my position of being an adult, able to choose the path that gives me succor and happiness and all of that, I finally said, after he made a few points, I said, Jim, you've given me something to think about, and I appreciate that. We then shortly thereafter went our separate ways to bed, and I woke up the next morning early and because I had to go back to the hotel for classes. And then they came back midday. There was Jim. And you know, he was working in his garden. He asked me to take a ride with him to the, to the gardening store to pick up some supplies. We spent the next two, three hours together. Never mentioned last night. I don't know if he remembered it. The point I'm making in this is that both my wife and I had situations where we were able to walk away, where we weren't all that concerned with being right. Because being, having that mindset of having to be right, you can be right, but having to prove that you are right when it isn't going to make that much of a difference in your life or the life of somebody else, that is a wonderful exercise in encouraging harmony. I'm not saying that we back off from every argument because some arguments are, they need to be made. Sides need to be drawn. Discussions need to take place fairly, calmly, dispassionately. And unfortunately, the sad news is, is that not all situations are going to be like that and that we aren't going to be able to come to a settlement in every situation. But I do believe that we can come to settlements in most situations. If we are dealing with rational people, people who are sober, that always helps. If it, 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 under certain conditions, we can make things right. Because, you see, we are predisposed to harmony. Think about that. We believe, us in this room, I'm assuming, unless there are any guests for whom this is all heresy, but for those of us on the Dharmic paths and the unity path believe that we are all part and parcel of the divine. And the divine seeks harmony in everything. The world, the universe is built on a, some sense of harmony. And sometimes it looks like chaos, but there's an underlying harmony underneath it. So, yes, we are predisposed to it. We don't always get it, but we're predisposed to look for it. Those who are soul-focused find it more than anyone else. And, of course, sadly, religions have one of the worst records in the world for, for achieving harmony for a, a, a variety of reasons. A lot of times it's, uh, uh, it's scripture. It, well, I just mentioned heresy. All of a sudden, a, a church, after many, many years of being together, one group, uh, the preacher says one thing that another person doesn't agree with in terms of interpreting the Bible, and pfft, Boom, you've got a schism. I've always said Protestants are like amoebas. I mean, they just always, always separate one to the other, to the other, to the other. And it's interesting that, that churches, when they separate, it, it, the people doing the separating are never the ones that say, you know, we should actually have a more progressive message. No, it's always, how can we become more confining? And even in, in uh, for instance, Hinduism, we really don't argue about doctrines all that much. It's, it's quite rare. But we'll yell at one another in terms of what are we going to paint the, paint the kitchen or the social hall in our temple or something like that. Okay, so there's always opportunities to get frustrated, to get angry with people, and to have disharmony. So it's extremely important. We should be the models of the world, not we here in this room necessarily. I'm talking about all religions. 
we should be the ones showing the way. Sadly, sadly, that is not the case. We have to make a, an extreme effort in our spiritual communities. And you know what? Separating sometimes is the best, the best idea out there. To separate with, with good feelings. With, with, you can still separate with harmony in the same way that two people in a marriage can separate harmoniously. I actually know a couple uh, recently divorced after um, about th uh, 30 plus years of marriage. You would not believe how harmonious that was. They used one lawyer and because they both still loved one another, just felt that they couldn't be married, it, it, it worked out very well. So just because there is some sort of separation, whether it's a spiritual community, a marriage, a friendship, a business, whatever, work harmoniously towards that separation. So how do we work on harmony? First of all, we affirm it. We affirm our goal. We affirm the task given to us that whatever has to be done is going to be done harmoniously, agreeably. When, when, when we start with that, we're always more likely to achieve that goal by first affirming. And then when there is disagreement, have rules of engagement and be bound by them. And if the other side breaks those rules, okay, so for instance, starts yelling, negotiation has to stop, all right? Break up for the night, cool off, come back tomorrow. But you have a set, rules, a set of rules that govern this discussion, keep to that discussion. As a matter of fact, I, um, I just ended a correspondence I was corresponding with a, with a gentleman um, on religious matters, and I had, to, I had to break off that because he was not following the rules of engagement. We agreed that we would discuss A, B, C, and D because X, Y, and Z had nothing to do with what we needed to talk about. And as much as I tried to focus on A, B, C, and D, he would try to take it back to X, Y, and Z. I finally, very gently, very lovingly, passed on that, on that correspondence relationship. So again, you don't need to be right in every situation. And here's a trick I've used many times. It's like, it's like negotiating with, uh, in business, right? So if I... If you're interested in buying my car, you might say, well, what do you want for it? And I might say, 20000 And in my head, I know that if you said 19000 I'd take that in a second, right? If you said 10000 well, then I absolutely not. And hopefully we would meet closer, so maybe I let it go for fifteen or 16000 And I walk away going, okay, I did, I did pretty well. Oftentimes when I've walked into negotiation with another person, even, even it's not business, it's personal, I will walk in completely prepared to acknowledge some error in my thinking. I will look for it. I, where can I say at some point, when can I say at some point, you know, you're absolutely right about this point. I, I can't disagree with you. So, so I'm giving you that. More often than not, if you tell someone they are right, they are going to give a little too. And hopefully, hopefully, you will come to a resolution. And whenever you can bring humor into it, this, oh, I, this is what I try to do, and you can't always do it in every occasion, but if ever there's a chance for humor, and if ever there's an opportunity to bring in 
the, the other elements of your lives that are in sync, that also makes for a good negotiation. It makes for agreeability. Try not to make it personal. All right? Try not to, to focus on the, the foibles of the person or people that you are discussing this with. And if something personal is leveled at you, try not to take it personally. Let it go. Because here at the core of so many of these things that we argue about, the core is ego. In Sanskrit, ahankara. We, we, when somebody says something against our religion, against our political beliefs, against where we work, against other friends, we are, we often, we do take it personally because what we, what we process is you are insulting me. You insult my religion. You insult my way of life. You insult my diet. On and on and on. You are insulting me. There is a chant in our tradition that we, we use. Praise is sweet and blame a dream. Praise is sweet and blame a dream. This is something that I affirm all the time whenever I am confronted with this kind of issue that where, where uh, um, my ego wants to take it personally. My ego wants to lash out. My ego wants to defend it. All of a sudden you think, why? Why, why get frustrated? If, if what they're saying about me is scandalous, if what they're saying about me will really harm my reputation, well then, that's a different story. But more often than not, I can take it. I can handle whatever issues you might have. Um, so, as part of that thinking, remember that our opinions, our gods, our politicians, none of them is truly you or me. Affirm that. None of those things are you or me ultimately. Involve and engage passionately when it matters while respecting the other side. That is to say, sometimes we do hold certain truths to be self-evident and you can, by all means, stand firm to your beliefs. If, if you are arguing human dignity, if you are arguing against racism, if you are arguing against autocracy, you're, you're, you're able to stand firm. But, and here's the challenge, try to give love while you're doing it. Try to see that other person as a human being, perhaps deluded, but still a human being and a child of God. Um, I'll tell you one other quick story that, that has a really happy ending. Uh, we live next door to two wonderful people, Dick and Pam. Uh, Dick and Pam, right now they're in their mid to late 80s. And about 15 years or so, they were here, they were in the neighborhood we moved into. Okay, they, their house is right next to our carriage house. No. It's, um, um, and our, our, our homes are rather close together. They were very welcoming when we moved in 20, uh, 20 odd years ago. I think 24 now, yeah, 24 years. Uh, they were very welcoming. Uh, we, we love them dearly. And they were very much do-it-yourself people. I mean, their garage was a workshop. They had everything. I, I didn't go to a hardware store for five years. I mean, just, oh, Dick must have one of these. Yep, he does. But then Dick retired from his job. And they became what we called the project people. And they, they had 
every instrument of torture you can imagine, especially when houses were close together and it's summertime, because they did their work in the driveway. They didn't do their work in the garage. The garage is just where they stored this stuff. They brought it all into the driveway, and they had a sander. They had a lathe. They had a circular saw. They had everything, a mulcher, everything that you can imagine, and it got loud, really loud, for long stretches in the day. We could not keep our windows open in the summertime because we'd be hearing <laughs> for hours. Finally, Teresa had enough, my wife, and she did something that I didn't think was wise. She wrote a letter, a really, really nice letter, telling them that they are the best neighbors anybody could ever have, but could they possibly not do this for all that time? And they reacted by uh, uh, telling us how insulted they were. And that caused a, 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 a real challenge for us. For a couple of years, they would not talk to us. Although every time I passed them, I saw them outside, I yelled, hello, how are you? I tried to engage in conversation. Uh, I got something very taciturn, blah, blah, blah. And I would just smile and say, okay, well, you have a great day. And I kept on doing that, and I kept on doing that. And then, at one point, I took the advice of a particular Swami, a Hindu monk. He's since passed away. His name is Swami Bhaktananda. Swami Bhaktananda had this exercise that he would encourage people to do. And I'm going to leave you with this exercise. Visualize all of those in the group who hurt you or if it's just one person, and mentally surround them with divine light. Then deeply pray, Lord, fill them with peace and harmony, peace and harmony, peace and harmony, over and over. You do that for one minute. And then afterward, visualize yourself surrounded by divine light and pray, Lord, fill me with peace and harmony, peace and harmony. Peace and harmony. Do that for 15 seconds. Now, he encouraged you to do this to, uh, five times a day. I realize that the fine time to do that, but it really it's only a minute and 15 seconds per time that you're doing this. And he says, you will see a change come over these individuals. I did that, and I did it five times a day as much as I could. I definitely did it once or twice a day. More often than not, I did it five times a day. I set a schedule to do it. Within a matter of months, we had a yard sale. They came to the yard sale. And they were jovial and friendly as if nothing ever happened. And from that point on, several years ago, until today, we have maintained our friendship. So, it can be done. Not all the time but it can be done. So let, let me leave you with just this affirmation. We are calling upon that sacred one that permeates every part of our lives, that flows in and around and through each one of us. Make us channels of harmony. Let us sow seeds of agreement where passions are uncontrolled, where frustration is prominent. Let us be the ones to bring light and love wherever and whenever we can. Om, peace.